Once I was a crusader for the Divine Order. I pledged my life to Lucian the Divine. The war changed everything. He sent me to save the elves I grew up amongst. I arrived too late. Lucian ordered the use of Death Fog against the Black Ring. Annihilating everyone I once knew in the process. Now I'm a mercenary killer. One of the infamous Lone Wolves. And my next target is none other than Lucian's own son. What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you some exciting lore about our origin character, Ifan Bin Metzd. I hope I'm saying that last name right, who knows, we're just going to call him Ifan. That we can finally do thanks to the release of the Godwoken graphic novel. Now that this novel is out, truth be told, is the entire reason I was waiting to do the origin characters anyway, because if you follow my channel because of Divinity Original Sin 2, you might be wondering why I haven't covered these guys in my lore series yet. And that is simply because I was waiting for this graphic novel to come out, because around the time I started doing these lore videos is around the time that novel was announced. So I've literally been waiting to do this the entire time, just in case they added anything particularly new. And we do get a few tidbits that at the very least, while not necessarily adding anything new, certainly help to fill things out. Now, one other quick housekeeping thing, Apparently, for the month of February, Control Ultimate Edition, or con some variation of Control, is going to be on PS Plus, I believe it is. My review after 100% of that game has been blowing up as a result. So if you happen to have came to my channel because of that, I just want to say thanks for watching. Most of what I do is CRPGs and related content like lore and story videos. Occasionally, I'll do a review after 100% for a game if I enjoyed it. 90% of it's going to be this. With those things out of the way, let's actually jump into what we are here to talk about, and that is simply iFan's origin story and who he is as a character as far as we know. So, first things first, as we learn from the Godwoken novel, Ifan was somehow orphaned and was raised by elves despite being a human child. Because of this, he is much more aware of their language and customs as opposed to most humans. And we also learn that Ifan was told stories of and eventually shown the horrors of the Black Ring and what they tend to do, especially to elf villages. And that is basically to burn them to the ground and do awful things to the inhabitants. Hearing these stories as a child and being raised on them in the company of elves, the first thing Ifan did when he became an adult was leave so he could go join the Divine Order. That is to say, Lucian the Divine's army, which he uses against the Black Ring. Now, while in the service of the Divine Order, Ifan quickly gained the attention of Lucian the Divine himself, and they became great friends, as well as Ifan serving in some capacity as Lucian's personal guard, it would seem, as well as a bit of a special forces kind of guy. Basically, if Lucian needed something done, Ifan was more often than not the guy for the job. Now, two things here, especially in this story when it comes to the Godwoken graphic novel, we learn a couple things. Ifan and Alexander don't seem to get along in any capacity, and that seems to mostly be because of Ifan and Lucian the Divine's relationship. The graphic novel certainly seems to imply some jealousy on Alexander's part in that regard. Also, quick side note, the Godwoken graphic novel shows Alexander being a grown man, but according to all sources that we have, is that Alexander would have been 14 at the time of this particular setting, which makes no sense, but either way. Then we bring ourselves to the year 1233. Again, part of the Godwoken novel, but we also knew this from a variety of other sources as well. In 1233, Lucian and his adopted son Damien are in all-out war with each other, and this comes to a head in an elven forest near a rift temple. Now, I have videos that talk all about Lucian and Damien's events during that. We're here to talk about Ifan. So, basically, in order to win this battle, Lucian and his advisors choose to use Death Fog. Ifan is chosen to travel with a scroll that will activate said rift temple, or at least a rift in general, and allow the elves to escape before the death fog is released, thus hopefully only killing Black Ring members and not the elves. While Ifan is able to get to the elves and warn them, the death fog almost immediately releases after he gets there and warns their leader, and Ifan thinks he is too late and is absolutely furious to say the very least about Lucian and his advisor's decision to go ahead and release the Death Fog, thus killing all of these elves, the very people that raised him. 
Not literally the same elves, mind you, but, you know, the people. So this is where we learn in the Godwoken graphic novel that the only reason Ifan survived this was because of his unique source power. So Source takes on a variety of forms in the Divinity universe. It's definitely a plot device in a lot of ways, but all of the origin characters have something specific going on with it, and Ifans is that he can summon a soul wolf. This wolf, sensing the imminent danger, is summoned and pulls Ifan to safety, which is why he doesn't die. Now at this point, we see Ifan cursing the very name of the Divine Order, saying he'd rather join the Black Ring than ever be with the Divine Order again. And then it cuts to a few years later, where we see him joining the Lone Wolves, as we would know he was a member of if we played Divinity Original Sin 2, which is presumably why you're here. Now, we see Ifan in full swing with the Lone Wolves, doing less than reputable things despite his past of being a righteous person, and ultimately we see him woken by Roost early in the morning one day, and mentioning that the Lone Wolves have a contract on Alexander's head, and that apparently he's been in Fort Joy where they've been rounding up sorcerers to send them to. So Roost, knowing at least some part, or at least guessing part of Ifan's past, decides that Ifan is the man for this job and suggests that he take on the contract, which Ifan agrees to. And then we see him in chains on his way to Fort Joy because Ifan deliberately got himself caught to get sent to Fort Joy so he could then take out his contract on Alexander. Now, that is everything that the graphic novel tells us as well as many in-game sources can tell us. So now let's talk about the stuff that specifically comes to light as part of the story of Divinity Original Sin 2. So we're gonna be taking this act by act. Now, the thing you need to understand though before we get into this is is while the origin story of Ifan is very much set in stone, his exact decisions or anything like that that you choose to have him do should you be playing as Ifan is not necessarily set in stone. So I'm mostly focusing on the things that are 100% going to be the case probably, or at the very least are more about how Ifan feels and conveys that he feels. But because of the, you know, prospect of player choice, as well as the marketing for the potential next game, if it ever comes back from hiatus, wow. Fallen Heroes, there are some things we can glean about Ifan that are canon versus, you know, stuff that happened that probably is versus stuff that is probably going to be left by the wayside type stuff. So I'm just trying to focus on the things that I can be like, this is for sure the case. Because of, again, the very nature of the game. When we start the game in Fort Joy, Ifan is going to want to find a guy named Boris, who is his contact, basically, who's going to give him some information that he needs to take down Alexander. Boris will ultimately give us a note. This will point us to a guy named Zalaskar. Zalaskar is an undead merchant just outside of Fort Joy who, if Ifan speaks to, he will give him a unique crossbow that deals piercing damage in order to help us with the fight with Alexander. And then, finally, at the end of Act 1, in which our character would have learned that he was Godwoken from Rollick, in Ifan's case, you will be able to take out the contract on Alexander by defeating Alexander, and to what Ifan thinks, actually killing him. Now at this point, we're going to leave Fort Joy, of course, with the Seekers, whose job it is to protect Godwoken and help them ascend to divinity. They're going to take us to Driftwood in search of one Meister Siva, who will help us on that journey. But more concerned with Ifan's personal story, when we arrive in Driftwood, Ifan will be sent a message to meet one Baron Levere at the inn. He will be delivered this message by a small child. There are some other interactions Ifan can have in town, such as a magister basically being like, hey, you're the guy. And, you know, you haven't kind of diffused that situation. That's kind of fun. But moreover, when you go talk to Baron Levere, it is revealed that Ifan knows this person and that Baron Levere is certainly not who he is. Who he actually is is a man named Callow, a fellow member of the Lone Wolves. Now, this is where we can learn that the Lone Wolves have been given contracts to hunt down Godwoken, which is why Alexander's head was asked for in this contract that Ifan was sent on. And, speaking of Alexander, in between Fort Joy and coming to Driftwood, you will discover that Alexander survives your first fight and was actually held in chains on the ship, during which Ifan can take the opportunity to kill Alexander again. Hopefully, for good this time. After we learn this information from Baron Levere, Baron, or should I say Callow, is going to point us to Roost, the guy who gave us the contract on Alexander's head, as well as the leader of the Lone Wolves. Now, I'm going to tell things a little out of order here. If you're playing the game, you wouldn't learn things exactly like this, but this is more about the story of Ifan versus, you know, how things are presented in Original Sin 2. 
So when you finally meet up with Roost, you can try to collect the contract basically on Alexander. However, you're going to find out very quickly that Alexander is apparently not dead and has been spotted on an island off the coast somewhere. Now, this is the point where Roost will turn on you no matter what you do. And when you have this fight, because remember, you're Godwoken, the Lone Wolves are trying to kill Godwoken, and you being a Lone Wolf means nothing to them if it comes to collecting the bounty. So Roost turns on you, and it turns out, as you learn from this information here, that the Lone Wolves have clearly been contracted by someone very dark and mysterious, probably Black Ring at the time, this is kind of the information you're presented with, to collect these bounties on Godwoken heads. Now, the other big thing Ifan will learn in Act 2 here is if you take him to the cave off the coast where you will fight Mortis as part of the main story, you can find a scientist. I believe her name is Zanisma, Zanisma, something like that. And she will be working on a death fog delivery device. Obviously, Ifan will have some things to say about this. And if you press her, she will eventually give up Hanag as the sorcerer who actually created the device. Obviously, Ifan will want words with this person. So, as luck would have it, Hanag is actually one of the Source Masters, the main quest of Act 2, points us to go talk to to learn how to expand our Source powers. And when you go and speak to Hanag, obviously it can end in a fight, but more importantly, the information Ifan can learn from this conversation is that if he speaks to Hanag, he can learn that he wasn't actually sent with a teleportation device or a rift activating device to the elves in 1233. What actually happened is that instead of being sent to warn the elves, Ifan was basically sent as a suicide bomber. The scroll he was carrying was the activation for the death fog. So when the elven re leaders read this scroll, it activated the death fog and that's what set off the whole chain of events. Obviously, Ifan is even more upset with this knowledge than he was to begin with, and you can probably imagine his mental state's probably not in a great place at this point. So eventually, Act 2 concludes with us expanding our source powers and setting off for the Nameless Isle, which is the place Godwoken go to potentially ascend to Divinity, provided they can pass the trials there. Now, in Act 3, we're going to catch up with Alexander, because this island is actually where he was that Roost referred to. So if you catch up with Alexander with Ifan in party or playing as him, you can speak to Alexander and basically tell him about the suicide mission. You know, basically kind of like ask for information. So Alexander will basically say that it was justified because what is Ifan's life in the face of, you know, winning this war? And to Alexander, what happened to the elves was a necessary evil, basically. And at this point, if you kill Alexander, he is dead and gone for good. However, this is the point of the story where Alexander's had a bit of a change of heart, and it is probably worth watching my Alexander lore video to get more information on that. That's pretty much it for Act 3. Act 3 ends with us failing to ascend to Divinity, of course, and then going to the city of Arx to track down Dallas, who stole Divinity from us, and deal with that situation. Now, the primary thing that Ifan is going to deal with in Act 4 is right at the end of it, and that is when we find out that Lucian the Divine is very much so alive, and has an elaborate plot to protect the world from the God King and the Void forever by purging the world of Source. However, being confronted with Lucian the Divine, Ifan can choose to basically forgive Lucian for all the things he's done, basically being the single biggest cause of woe in Ifan's life, or he can choose to kill him, not being able to let it go. Now, once this fight is resolved, someone in your party can potentially claim divinity, or one of the other various endings to the game. Ifan's recommended ending, and if you ask him his opinion what he will actually want, is source to be shared with everyone because having seen the horrors of war and basically how all of this stuff results in people dying, he believes that no one should be divine. Provided, of course, you aren't actually playing as him, because if you're playing as him, you can do whatever you please. Now, because Fallen Heroes put out a bunch of marketing before it was put on hiatus, we do have some information for what happens after the game. And that is simply that if the world is purged of source, Ifan supposedly goes on to rejoin the elves who raised him and helping regrow their forest now that the threat has been dealt with because if the world is purged the veil of source is restored thus protecting the world from the void permanently however 
Fallen Heroes takes place two years after Divinity Original Sin 2 takes place, Fallen Heroes taking place in the year 1244. And at this point, we see that Ifan has very clearly and prominently rejoined the Divine Order in service to Lucian, the False Divine, under the Purged Source ending of Divinity Original Sin 2. And as for what comes next for Ifan, we will simply have to wait and see if any more information is given from Larian Studios in subsequent titles or any other media they happen to put out. So there you go, guys. That is the story of iFan in the Divinity lore. Thank you so much for watching. I truly appreciate every single view. Really helps the channel grow. Things are going great on that end. So again, just thank you guys so much. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.